we're at? We're right at 1115. We're going to go ahead and start promptly. All right, y'all. I'm Alex. I am a person in long-term recovery. I've been clean since 6314, and I'm also a data specialist for Oxford House for the pretty much the whole nation now that I've taken over doing the uh, annual surveys that most of y'all have taken in the past or are about to take within the next couple months. We'll be wrapping it up. Um, so in this panel, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to discuss recovery research with particular emphasis on studies involving Oxford House residents. Over the years, there has been an enormous amount of research done on the Oxford House model and on Oxford House residents. The large uh, body of data about Oxford House and its successful outcomes led the federal government to list Oxford House as a best practice on SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, NREPP. The Oxford House program was also singled out as a successful program in the 2016 Surgeon General's Report on Addiction. Uh, Oxford House Incorporated and Oxford House residents have been in the forefront of fostering recovery research. Recovery research was long hampered by the historic focus on anonymity by the 12 step groups. While anonymity has its purposes, it has also had the effect of limiting research on recovery. Uh, Oxford House residents and alumni work to overcome this limitation. John Major has led significant studies on Oxford House and the recovery process in general and worked closely with Lenny Jason and his team at DePaul University. The researchers have been assisted in their work by Oxford House residents and alumni and by graduate students. So I'm gonna go ahead and read a little bit about uh, John Major. PhD is a professor of psychology at Harry S. Truman College, one of the city colleges of Chicago. In addition to having over a decade of clinical experience, he has 30 years research experience with persons recovering from substance use disorders. Dr. Major is a consultant for the Center of Community Research and has worked closely with its director, Dr. Leonard A. Jason, in investigations involving Oxford House for nearly 25 years. Dr. Major has served as an expert witness in several legal matters involving recovery, home, recovery homes residents for the past 15 years, which has resulted in favorable judgments for recovery home residents. He continues to serve as a consulting editor and reviewer for several scholar, scholarly journals in the field. His areas of interest include 12-step involvement, social support, abstinence, self-efficacy, and his recent research project at Truman College focused on understanding mechanisms that promote recovery among residents taking MAT. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to all three of them. They're gonna kind of tag team it and go back and forth sharing the same PowerPoint. Um, so next we have Ted J. Boback. And uh, Ted earned a master's degree from DePaul University where he's currently a doctoral candidate pursuing a PhD in community psychology. His general research interests include substance use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery with a primary focus on recovery home residents. Currently, Ted is constructing social networks, social network models that will enrich our understanding of how individual recovery home social networks are created, maintained, and dissolved. And then we have Dane Wilson. Uh, Dane is from Sherville, Indiana, attending DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. He is pursuing a bachelor's degree in decision analytics. His research interests include the use of technology and recovery, medication-assisted treatment, and drug replacement therapy, 12-step uh, meetings, and social network dynamics. So I'm excited to hear from all of them. As a data specialist, I've surveyed as many people in Oxford House as possible. So last year, out of a reported 14,000 17 members in 26 states, we were able to survey 12,259 members, which is roughly 87%. Uh, and with 30 questions from each survey, we've collected 367,770 points of data. So if y'all need any of that, that information, let me know and I'll help y'all out. And uh, it's here for, for the team. Morning. Morning. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Dr. John Major, and I'm part of this panel. Um, I'd like to start out first by giving some acknowledgments to uh, Dr. Jason. 
He's the one who, back in 1991, saw the 60 Minutes episode with Paul Malloy from his home. And he calls Paul Malloy the next day and he says, wow, what you guys are doing is fabulous. Do you have anybody evaluating what you're doing? And that began, began a long-term relationship for over 30 years, where Dr. Jason, for about nine years, was doing some research on Oxford, homes, uh, Oxford houses. Um, and by 2000, he finally started getting some funding. And I came on board in 1998. And it's been a beautiful relationship. Anyway, Dr. Jason could not make it this year. Uh, he had surgery two years ago, so he, he couldn't make it then. But we expect him to be at the Oxford House Royal Convention in 2022. Um, but this guy, he won the Tom Fellows Award, I think, in 2013, you know, being a friend of Oxford House. And he's just made significant contributions not only to Oxford House, not only to recovery homes in the literature, but he is a world-renowned clinical community psychologist. He's, he's one of the biggest people still alive in his profession. So we just want to say uh, thank you, Dr. Jason, for your hard works uh, that made it possible for us to present today. So uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce... Uh, our session, we're going to take about maybe 45 minutes, and then we want to throw it out for questions and answers. We're going to start talk, uh, by talking about the social network research and homophily effects, and uh, Ted will be discussing that. He'll be followed by Dane, who's going to talk about COVID-19 and the online recovery survey. Uh, by show of hands, uh, anybody take that survey yet, or at least you've seen it? Great. Please spread the word because some of the stuff that I'm gonna follow up on has to do with data that we collected at the Oxford House Conference, I think in 2017. Um, and I'll be uh, talking about homophily effects with respect to residents taking medication-assisted treatments. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Ted Bobeck. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Alex, for the warm introduction and for not mispronouncing Cherville. I'm sure that means a lot to Dane. Um, so, okay, I'll get started uh, talking a little bit about, I don't know how many of you all participated in, we were collecting social network data in 2017 to 2019. And uh, I wanted to give you all a little bit of a, like a synopsis or a rundown of what came out of those data and how we're looking at it. Because that's been my specialty recently. It's like social networks. So what, what are they? What are social networks? So the term social network, it means a lot of things, right? A lot of people say Facebook is a social network or like an exclusive club is a social network. And that could be really confusing for us if we're trying to all talk about the same thing. So for this presentation, any relationship among at least two individuals, I'm thinking is a social network. So my examples here would be in early recovery, our social network or one social network tends to fluctuate uh, as the person that we look at as the ego, right? Like I have an ego, but I, in terms of social network analysis, I would be the ego. I'd be the person who's perceiving or the focal actor of the play. Think of it in terms of a play or like a movie. The focal actor is the ego. Uh, and we learn how to discern from other people, which we call alters, uh, if we're comfortable like seeking advice from them or if they're misleading us, we would go to someone else. So it constantly evolves and changes. And the data that we collected from you all, which we're super grateful for, allows us to kind of examine and explore these relationships. This little model here would be the ego going out to the altar. And it's only a one directional relationship. You can see the ego is probably going to the altar for advice, but the altar is not going back to the ego for advice. So it's only one directional relationship. Some examples of networks, and I want to thank Dane for coming up with some analogies that I have for these, because they could get a little confusing. So like the tree network, right? You could see that people are connected, but it's kind of like everybody at the top has to go to the bottom, right? There's always two it's like a business model, right? Like, I don't like business, but I could have flipped it over and it could have been a triangle, right? The boss on top, and then there's two like, uh, I don't know, assistant managers underneath them and then the workers at the bottom. So the boss is supposed to know everything and then it trickles down to the other people and then the people at the bottom know probably the least about the business, right? That might not be that helpful in an Oxford house, right? We don't want, we want more people to be connected. We don't want like a hierarchy where everybody's reporting to like one person or the furthest distance here, you have to go to two people at least to get to anyone else. So 
Another example is like a ring. This one is, here's a good thing, right? It prevents collision, because you're always one stop away from another person. But it limits that the connections are only two. You're only connected to two people on both sides. And if you want to get to the person at the bottom, you got to go to one, two, three, then you could get to somebody. So it takes you like four people to get to the one person you're seeking advice from. So that might not be as helpful either. It avoids collision, but like how do we grow? We grow through like collision and like learning how to, dem dem I'm sorry, democratic process, right? In an Oxford house, we got to kind of get into a little altercation, go to other people, figure it out. And that, that's kind of like the basis of recovery, working on our relationships. And this, the, the circle one, the ring, doesn't really foster that. It kind of, you still have to go through a bunch of mediators. This one, Dane uh, said, is like a cult, right? There's a, there's a person in the middle, and everybody's got to report to that person in order for information to get to other people. So if you want to join a cult, this is the way to go. Or if you want to be the cult leader, you want to be the center point, right? In a, in a recovery home, especially in Oxford House, not, not a good idea, right? We don't want anybody leading the show or pretending like, you know, they've got the market cornered. Ideally, in an Oxford House, right, we'd like this model, the mesh. Everybody's connected to everyone else. You're always only one person. You, you, you're directly contacting every person in the house, right? Information's flowing. You're sharing your experiences, strength, and hopes. You got to give it away to keep it kind of thing. And everybody's connected. I could go to this person. I could go to that person. Ideally, this is a good, good model for a recovery home. Everyone is accessible to everyone else. So some network measure examples that we use to like implement into the model, right? Like what's the model? Like what can I measure with that mesh model? One thing I can measure is friendship. And it involves the back and forth exchange of ideas. And then we do like a cost benefit analysis. Like do I want to keep talking to this person? Are they causing me more harm than good? And if they are causing you more harm, you, you, we might want to terminate that relationship. So, and I could look at that, right? Another thing, we have to interpret the time we spend with people in a positive way for them to be considered friends. So my, my example would be, I'm here at this convention with y'all. And I interpret this in a positive way. I'm having a good time. Y'all are welcoming and allow me to come in here and share my ideas. So that makes me want to do the work all the more when I get back to work. I want to do these analyses. I get motivated to do it. You know, and just like y'all, you go to the workshops, you hear some things, you're like, I can apply that when I get to my house. You know, it's like, then you think of Oxford House as your friend. And that's a good thing. We want that. Another thing that we measured with our survey was uh, willingness to loan. And that kind of allowed us to figure out trust. So if I would be willing to loan Dane or Dr. Major some money, I trust them, right? But, <laughs> but it also depends on how much I'm willing to loan them. So if I'm willing to loan them 10 or $20, I, I trust them a little less than if I'm willing to give them 100 or $500. So the trust thing would be like, I, I believe they're going to pay me back. And if a person doesn't pay you back, I would go back to the friendship. I'm interpreting this negatively because you took my money, you didn't give it back to me, and the relationship will probably be terminated. And last that we measured is like the factors was advice seeking. It was also, we, we look at it as a supportive, socially assessed resource, right, for people in recovery. And I think in recovery, a lot of people call it sharing your experience, but we call it advice seeking. So it's, it's a similar thing, right? Like some of the literature says we resist giving advice because it discredits us kind of thing. So we go just for research purposes. But it's basically like, who am I willing to go to for advice? Like the other model, is it one way? Is it two way? Because then if it's a one way, the person's a little bit above us, right? So we have newcomers coming in. They're looking up to the people with some time. And then after a while, that newcomer gets some time and maybe they're talking equally to the other person, then it's back and forth. You know, like I could go to Dane for advice and I could, uh, he could go to me, and then at the beginning, I think you were just coming to me, but now I could go to you. So it goes back and forth. And that's called reciprocity. We also came up with this pretty cool thing called a recovery factor. So it takes eight measures that you all filled out on the survey, uh, which were these measures. We looked at how much you make, how much a person makes, do they have employment, I should have put employment, but it looked at wages and employment. Are you employed? What's your quality of life look like? Self-efficacy is we measured with uh, how confident would you be in certain scenarios to resist the use of drugs. Self-efficacy was a scale that we had. Stress, our social support, uh, 
Can you count on this person to help you move? Questions like that. And a sense of community. Do I feel like I belong to this Oxford house? Do other people accept me? You know, what are my feelings about that? And then lastly, hope. Those were the indicators that made up the recovery factor. So kind of switching gears, but not really. Homophily talks about birds of a feather flock together. That, that's all that word means. So it means that similarity breeds connection. So the more I have in common with someone, the more likely I am to form a friendship with them. The more I have dissimilar with them, the less I'm going to go to them for advice because I don't feel like they could give it to me. So homophily is what I looked at in my thesis. And I was here two years ago, and I promised that I would talk a little bit about what I found in my thesis. And for that one, I wasn't looking at social networks a little bit, but it was more focused on people who had dual diagnosis or psychiatric comorbidity. So if you had addiction plus any other psychiatric issue, for instance, uh, depression or anxiety or bipolar, any of that, I couldn't narrow down which one it was because our instruments weren't uh, designed for that. I could just look at what your um, susceptibility was to be comorbid or dual diagnosed. Um, so it's the principle of connection between similar people. And I said that it occurs at a higher rate um, or a lower rate with dissimilar people. This was my thesis. Um, my dissertation is different. This was my thesis. I was saying basically this model, right? I was saying that here. Is there a mouse up there? There's no mouse up there. Um, no. So length of stay predicts quality of life. So basically I'm saying that people who stay in an Oxford house longer have a higher quality of life. That came out to be true. So the longer you stay, minimum we found is six months. You want somebody to stay in Oxford House at least the six months, then they hit like this plateau. I don't want to call it a plateau because that almost sounds like it's stagnant, but they hit like a good quality of life compared to the general public who aren't suffering from mental illness or uh, addiction, right? So length of stay then became pretty good. It became stable. Like people were enjoying life. They weren't like wishing for death or dreading to get up or like, why didn't God kill me yet, you know, kind of thing. So quality of life improved. Then I was saying, well, like, why did quality of life improve? And what kind of like tells us about that? And I was saying that psychiatric severity would determine if people's quality of life improves. And it turns out that people, there was a negative relationship, right? So as psychiatric severity rose, quality of life declined. People with dual diagnosis were having lower scores in quality of life if they had a higher psychiatric severity. So that was telling me that, like, how can I improve that? Because I want to improve stuff. I want to live in the solution, right? How, what can be done to improve that? And that's where house composition comes into play. If we had a person by themselves with a psychiatric severity issue or dual diagnosis in a house, and all the residents in the house didn't, that person didn't do as well as when there was at least two people who had dual diagnosis in the house. And I had a lot of theories about why that is. Maybe they felt comfortable talking to this person. They didn't have to walk around eggshells. They thought maybe that somebody could understand them better than the housemates. Either way, their, their scores improved dramatically. Their quality of life improved just by including a second person with psychiatric severity in the house. So I don't know what that necessarily means for Oxford House policy, but I would think that maybe if a newcomer's coming in and you already have somebody in the house, you might want to be like, okay, well, this house could use another person like that. So the other person, both of them improved the same way. So both people's improved. But if they're by themselves, you know, it, it might be lonely for them. I, I can't say what kind of policy. Maybe that's something you could bring home. And when you guys want to take someone in, you could be like, oh, I remember Ted said that at the conference. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. Okay. That, that, that was my thesis, that's what I found. I think maybe next year I'll be done with my dissertation and I'll come back and tell you all about the social network and if the two people who have psychiatric severity, if they're even friends, because now I have the ability to look at that, right? We know that having them in the house is important, but like, do they trust them? Are they friends? Will they go to each other for advice? I'm going to take it a step further and look some more. And like Alex was saying, I know we all ask you all to take a lot of surveys. And uh, Dan, Dane Wilson here is going to ask you all to take one more. And I just want to say on uh, everyone's behalf, we're really grateful for that. Because data like this comes out that can help you all in your decision making process. Thank you for allowing me to be here. <laughs> all right. 
Hey, everybody. Uh, get this guy up. Hey. <laughs> uh, my name's Dane. On the first slide, it said Daniel. Um, I prefer Dane, so uh, just so there's no confusion when you're looking back. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, thank you all for the opportunity. This is my first time presenting. I'm an undergraduate. Uh, I want to thank um, John and Ted, you know, Dr. Jason, that the picture on the first slide. Um, you know, he's a veteran. These guys are, 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 are in it, you know, and I'm new to, the, uh, to this whole uh, presenting and collecting data, but I'm super grateful um, that they gave me an opportunity. Dr. Jason wanted, you know, wanted to be here, and when he realized he couldn't, uh, he extended an invitation to me to come and, and practice, uh, practice what I'm, what I'm researching and, and uh, practice presenting, really. So I just want you guys to be gentle with me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a real measure of the character that they could be like, hey, the uh, the old hat can't make it. Let's send the new guy in. You know, I think it's really cool. Um, so first, do I press enter to go forward? Or the arrow, arrow to the right. Okay, cool, perfect. All right, so um, I am here collecting data for a virtual recovery uh, survey. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at DePaul University in Chicago, and I work with Ted and Dr. Major, uh, as well as Dr. Jason, at the Center for Community Research. Uh, we're, we're working on a study. They've helped me kind of um, uh, create this survey, which uh, deals with user perception of online or virtual meetings. We're trying to get a better understanding of how Zoom and other recovery meeting tools have been implemented by folks in recovery. Um, period. <laughs> uh, we have created a survey to measure your impressions of virtual meetings. And my goal at this convention is to recruit as many of you as possible to take part in this survey. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many people don't do well in isolation? Yeah, right on. Me neither. Um, I spent quarantine in Chicago. Uh, I'm from suburban Indiana. And when I felt when I moved to, to you know, uh, the pretty much, you know, the inner city in Chicago, um, I fell in love with the community and the culture and all the activities and the co connections that were available to me. Now, in normal times, uh, Chicago is a super vibrant city. And um, as much as I love my apartment and the walls of my apartment and the roommates in my, in my apartment, it's been a, a tough year and a half. Um, most of my social interactions in 2020 took place over Zoom. Uh, so now the recovery community in Chicago has been really fortunate this past summer. Uh, the restrictions have loosened up and more and more in-person meetings have begun to open back up. There was a time last March when uh, you couldn't find one. You had to go to the burbs maybe. Um, and you know, I, I moved to, to the city so that I wouldn't have to have a car. You know, I could get around in public transportation. Um, so that became, that became increasingly difficult. Uh, but interestingly though, Many of the online meetings which started last March in response to the lockdown measures have decided to continue and are still going strong. Um, now, uh, there are many who find online meetings preferable. For instance, individuals who might feel stigmatized if they were to be seen attending meetings in their communities, single parents with time constraints and workers on second shift, you know, like the two to 10, um, all the best meetings, you know, a lot of good meetings, especially, uh, are in the evening time, you know? Um, folks in communities where the language that they speak is different than, than the language of, of the people in their communities. Um, people attending inpatient treatments. Uh, I know that the uh, H&I committee has had a lot of success. Um, you know, coming into Zoom, bringing speakers from across the country to speak with people who are in inpatient um, and incarcerated individuals. Um, now I'm not, I don't work at jails, uh, but I, I can see, I can envision uh, a future where, where this technology is, is super useful. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever been locked up, but one might imagine. <laughs> right? Yeah, you don't have to show your hands on that one. <laughs> but uh, we, could, we could imagine like how helpful it would be to uh, virtually attend an outside meeting uh, with people who are living in the world and recovering and who have been in that position uh, and, see, you know, see that on the screen and then, you know, go back to ourselves and, uh, and ruminate on that. Um, you know, hope is in short supply in, in those institutions, uh, but hope is in, it's an abundant resource in the rooms. So while virtual meeting methods have been available for decades, you know, uh, I don't know, some of your old timers might think of phone meetings or even like uh, virtual recovery chat rooms. Um, the pandemic has necessitated like a mass migration of recovering individuals to platforms like Zoom, Skype, and in the rooms. 
I know in Chicago they even implemented a virtual area. So now they have an area, you know, they got the north side city area, they got the south city area, and they have a virtual area where uh, folks in the Chicago land area can start a meeting, but people from all over can attend. It's available on the, uh, the, 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 web, the world website. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. And all right, so due to the lockdown restrictions and social mis uh, distancing mandates associated with COVID-19, um, many in recovery were faced with a new challenge, how to leave the church basements and community centers and transition to virtual 12-step meetings in order to con stay connected in isolation. Recovery communities have risen to the challenges posed by COVID and continued to come together while staying apart to make this transition and support one another. Whether you love them or hate them, virtual meetings have the potential to be a powerful tool for recovery. So at this point, there hasn't been much research to explore how these online meetings are perceived by those in recovery. With the help of the team at the Center for Community Research at DePaul, Dr. Major, Ted, and I have been working on a study to, serve, to find out more about user perceptions of online meetings. We could use your help. Uh, we want to hear from you how well online meetings fulfill their primary purpose. How do virtual meet meetings help facilitate your recovery and where do they fall short? Specifically, our study in the survey um, uh, that focuses on five areas. So access to online meetings, convenience. You know, I like to wear sweatpants when I'm on Zoom. Nobody gets to see. It's pretty comfortable, you know. Uh, cost of attending online meetings, strength of online recovery networks, uh, and uh, quality of the social support that we find in virtual meetings. So as the first generation, pretty much, to figure out in mass how to utilize these virtual recovery methods, we have a unique opportunity to share what we have learned while the lessons are still fresh in our minds. Our job as researchers is to collect and analyze your feedback, compile that information, and publish the findings to help inform treatment and housing professionals. So, you know, if you're uh, coming out of a treatment facility, and, you know, I, I know it uh, can be tough to find somewhere to go, um, we want to give those counselors uh, some good information to, to work with. Um, so they can take your insights and offer support and guidance to the next generation of recovering individuals in need of uh, new spaces to recover in the digital age. So um, next year when we come back, we'll let you know what we found out, hopefully, uh, when, when you guys uh, take the survey. So now I'm going to tell you about the survey. In, uh, in your welcome packets, you will find a flyer with a QR code. Okay, it looks like that. <laughs> um, I don't know if everybody's got their glasses or whatever, but there's a, there's a little dinosaur in the link, which I think is uh, pretty nifty. Ted came up with that one. He's, he's the tech genius over here. Um, it links to a survey that will help us learn more about what does and doesn't work for you when it comes to online meetings. The relationship between DePaul Center for Community Research and Oxford House has been incredibly valuable in helping community research in DePaul to can understand more about living in recovery. Much of the work that we are doing at the Center for Community Research wouldn't be possible without the active engagement of Oxford House residents. So please take five to 10 minutes to share your thoughts with us. Doesn't take more than that. I, I did a practice run, took three. Ted took four, he's a slower reader. Um, we had another volunteer, took her seven, I think, because she read the entire disclaimer at the beginning, which I you know, took for granted I didn't read that. Uh, I wrote it, so. Uh, but. Uh, so if you want, you can scan it right now, but there's no need to panic. Uh, we'll have a slide. We'll leave it up at the end when we're doing the Q&A part. Um, and also, you can come down and see us in the vending room. We have a table. Uh, also, uh, Ted utilized um, a, a little bit of his uh, obsessive compulsive and made it look real pretty. So it's like a checkerboard pattern. So there's like, uh, I think, 18 flyers and 18 QR codes. So if you guys all you know, uh, swarm on the table, you'll each have, I'll be able to do it. Um, so it'll be uh, quick and painless, and it'll be super helpful. You know, we'll be able to analyze that data. It'll give me something to do as a volunteer at the Center for Community Research um, for the next year. And, uh, you know, and we'll be able to get those results out and hopefully come back next year and uh, let you know what, what we found. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you for your time, and uh, I'll keep coming back. Good morning again. I gotta say, uh, kind of surprised with Dania. He's the only one in here with a mullet. <laughs> He's gonna bring it back. It. He is rocking it. Okay, uh, so what I, I like to talk about is some research involving Oxford House residents uh, taking medication assisted treatment. If you were here two years ago, uh, you'll remember some of my Prezi. Um, I got good news and some other news. Um, the other news is I'm going to do a quick review of two of those studies because it sets the stage 
for the current research that I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, and that's the good news. Uh, if you could just kind of suffer through the first half, the second half will go by fast. Uh, I'm a professor. We're long-winded by nature. So as I tell my students, fasten that seatbelt and slam that Red Bull. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, the whole thing about medication-assisted treatment and uh, us researchers with Oxford House came about around 2015. Um, Dr. Chris Beasley uh, was at the Center for Community Research. He took an academic post at Washington College. He started collecting some data, uh, mostly uh, on the Eastern Shore and I think a few uh, houses in Montgomery County, looking at residents who are taking medication-assisted treatment. Uh, it was the first study. Um, I analyzed the data, I, then I took the lead and this came out in 2018, basically saying that Oxford House residents have negative attitudes among those who are taking medication-assisted treatment. Now, some of you who've been around a few 24 hours, you know that nobody in the 12-step community and nobody in Oxford House was going to embrace somebody taking that stuff. But something changed in the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, not just in the treatment centers, but also in the 12-step communities and Oxford House. It's a paradigm shift. Uh, so it makes sense that at this time point that uh, a number of residents were thinking like, oh, if you're on medication assisted treatment, then you're still using, you're getting high, uh, and we would definitely not vote you in the house, which is weird. About 66 to 75 percent of that sample held those attitudes, and they endorsed these items that we will not let you in the house if you're taking this medication or that medication, and we think you're getting high. Um, that's crazy. Now... The data came from one state. And you have to wonder, well, if the negative attitudes are so harsh, why are folks on medication-assisted treatment coming into the Oxford houses? It doesn't make sense. So maybe that sample was not representative. Uh, maybe it was assigned at times. And that gave me an idea to put together an IRB protocol. And I started collecting data uh, with the assistance of others like, like Ted and Dr. Jason, some other folks who were here a couple years ago. And that led to the first study I want to review. This is something that we presented two years ago. And I'm going to refer to that as the Truman College study. Uh, we want to examine MAT attitudes or medication assisted treatment. And I kind of got the sense positive and negative attitudes probably have something to do with house characteristics. And that's something that Ted was talking about when he was discussing homophily. Um, you know, there's somebody who's like me in the house, and that's probably going to be instrumental in my recovery. Well, we collected data. Uh, we had um, a room at that conference. I think it was, might have been D.C. or was that Kansas City? Yeah. In Kansas City, um, and we got people lined up. You know, me and this other uh, research assistant, we went out and had smokes, and that's how we recruited people. And they're like, <laughs> get them when they're having their cigarette, they'll do anything, right? <laughs> so we collected data and we analyzed house characteristics by uh, creating three groups. And you'll see on the board, um, yeah, the mouse isn't showing. Um, non mat house, mat house, mat resident. Then you see in parentheses, N equals something. N is, is a sign meaning number. So the number of people in the non-MAT house was 98. In other words, you are an Oxford House resident, you're not taking mats, and no one in your house is taking mats. Then we found that another group of folks, they were what we call a MAT house. There were 34 uh, respondents there. They themselves are not taking medication-assisted treatment, but they have at least one person in the house who does. And then the third group, looking at the attitudes among those who are taking medication-assisted treatment. Uh, and we found overall a lot more positive attitudes. Something changed only in a couple of years. And I'm going to show you a table on the next slide, giving you some numbers. That's sort of like the not so good news about this presentation. I'm going to hit you with some numbers. So, you know, sip that Red Bull. So these were questions that came from the Washington College study. We want to replicate it. And we had buy-in from a number of states across the U.S. And we looked at the responses among those whose drugs of choice were opioids or heroin because they probably had stronger attitudes about some kind of, of a help with respect to recovery. Now, the four questions we use to tap into attitudes are on the board and they're highlighted. You know, do you think someone taking buprenorphine or naloxone, well, we call it uh, Suboxone, because that's the common name of that. Do you think somebody using that MAT is uh, a using addict or do you think somebody using meth uh, taking methadone is a using addict? And then the other two questions asking, uh, would you definitely vote against them if they were a prospective resident interviewing to come into your Oxford house? So it's kind of hard. This is supposed to be a quick review. But what is astonishing is when you look at 
those in the mat house, in other words, respondents who are not taking mats, but they have at least one person in their house who is, and the mat residents who are taking mats. Numerically, the numbers are different, but statistically, they're the same. And the takeaway here is, if you're living in a house with somebody on MATs, you're less likely to say, I have a negative attitude. Uh, there's a smaller percentage of people, and statistically, they're the same, whether you're taking mats or you're living with somebody with a mat. But if you're in a home, you're not taking mats. Nobody in the home is. You're kind of far removed from that experience, and you're going to have more negative attitudes. That makes sense. That could kind of explain why there's mixed attitudes. But what I think is fascinating, and I think I could understand a little bit more deeper, is when I looked at the data, about a third, 29% of everyone in that sample reported that they have a history of taking MAT. Now, for those uh, who are not currently taking MATs, who report a history of taking MATs, half of them said they did it to get high. Over half of them said they did it illegally or by diversion. Now it's making sense to me because if that was me and I was using that stuff to get high and I got somebody coming into my house, I'm gonna be like, mother flower, you're using. <laughs> and I'm gonna project, I'm gonna project my experience onto them. Now, those who are presently taking MATs, their rates were considerably lower. You see, 7% reported being, quote, high on MAT, 7% reported using MATs without a prescription. In all candor, it's three residents, and those three residents left those questions blank. You know, maybe they skipped it. We get that. About 7% of any sample, you're going to have missing data. So they could have you know, been overwhelmed, but it, it was a long survey. It's nothing like what Dan's going to be showing you today. Maybe they skipped it, or maybe they're like, yeah, uh, so I'm going to leave it blank. So if we were really conservative in our estimation, that is considerably lower. And that leads me to infer when folks taking MATs are coming to the houses, they're doing it the way the treatment providers are telling them, because that's what treatment is today. Not 10 or 20 years ago, when they're like, you know, uh, pray, don't use, and go to meetings. So we got to be very careful not to project our own experiences. And, and there's reasons for that. That has to do with the rest of my presentation. So that's pretty cool. And what is also cool is folks in each of those groups that I explained had comparable rates of continuous abstinence, comparable rates of involvement in their 12-step groups, AA and NA, and length of stay in an Oxford house. So the takeaway is the Oxford house model it meets the needs for folks on MATs, and that's crucial. Um, if you were here a few years ago, uh, I, <laughs> I kind of opened my mouth. It was a good feel-good about MATs. I was on that panel with Dr. Compton and, and, and Dr. Clark from SAMHSA, uh, and I came loaded for a battle because the year before, the director of SAMHSA was shaming people in attendance, shaming new people, saying, we got drugs for your cigarettes, we got drugs for your vapes, we got drugs for your coffee, and I know you're not taking mats right now, but your recovery would be better if you, t and people just ate her up like, are you kidding? No, I'm doing good. Why are you trying to tell me what to do for my recovery? So I thought she was going to be on that panel that year, and this is on C-SPAN, and uh, ever since then, I've not been invited to be on the Blue Ribbon panel. Because <laughs> there is data out there showing that methadone is killing more people than helping them. The problem is there's this false dichotomy. It's either harm reduction or total absence. And now we're realizing they're coming together. And that's where Oxford House comes in. You will be saving people's lives, helping bridge them into the recovery because without that kind of recovery home, it's not gonna be good. Okay, so the second study, really quick, we're looking at social support. We know Oxford House works. We know something about social support, especially in the Oxford Houses, are, are very therapeutic, we just don't know why. And like Ted was talking about looking at social dynamics and social networks, that might help us understand why it's effective. But you know, we're academics, we have to kind of know those things and ask those questions. So we know social support is really good in that it reduces stress. Across samples, uh, uh, across populations, social support is a good thing. We know that stress is a bad thing. Stress leads to negative outcomes. But social support also promotes positive outcomes. For example, absent self-efficacy, like Ted mentioned, and that's the confidence or belief in one's ability to effectively engage in recovery and quality of life. Now, these things are really important because now in the addiction research world, they want to see measures that are not specific to abstinence. That way, it could generalize to all pathways of recovery. 
So I wanted to take a look at that. And I firmly believe folks who are taking MATs are at a disadvantage. For them to try to connect with a social network is a huge stressor. And I know this from my own experiences and I know this from the literature. They'll go to a 12-step meeting and maybe you know 12-step members with really good intentions say some real common and ignorant stuff to them. Narcotics Anonymous uh, came out with an IP in 2016. It's on the internet. And they say, hey, people on MATs are, it's a pamphlet on MATs. And you're welcome to come here knowing some of our members might not be so receptive, but you know, a lot of us are. And some groups, they don't discriminate recovery whether you're on MATs or not. Um, unfortunately, I love Narcotics Anonymous, but it's gotten a bad rap because of few bad eggs. So if I'm on MATs, I'm going to be like, oh, shit, when I go to a meeting and somebody is going to give me that advice, oh my God. like Ted was pointing out, as opposed to sharing experience, strength, and hope. It's like Aesop's fable. You know, the sun won the, the battle against the wind. He's just showing us brilliance, wasn't forcing the issue. And I've come here for, in recent years, I've heard some really great success stories on people on MATs. Now, honestly, you can tell me this 15 years ago, but, you know, recovery is about changing, right? Sink or swim. All right, so this is the model, sort of like what Ted was showing. It's a mediation model. I want to understand, does social support have some impact on the relationship between stress and what you see on the right-hand side, quality of life and absence of self-efficacy? Those are the outcomes. And there are arrows, and this is kind of weird you know, science stuff, but there's relationships. The relationship between stress and social support is what we call inverted or negative Meaning if you have a lot of stress in your life, you probably have very little social support. But if you have a lot of social support, you're probably going to have reduced stress. Uh, we also know that there's an inverted relationship between stress on the one hand and quality of life and absence of self-efficacy on the other hand. If you have a high stress, you're going to decrease your quality of life. You're going to have decreases in absence of self-efficacy. Very instrumental for ongoing recovery. But social support has a positive relationship with these outcomes. You have more social support, you'll have a better quality of life. You have more social support, higher absence self-efficacy. So this mediational model is kind of pointing to this idea. We know that stress is a mother flower and it's gonna to lead to decreases in quality of life and absence self-efficacy. Could something like social support neutralize it? So in other words, it's sort of like, is it like Alka-Seltzer? Think about stomach acid leading to farting and stomach pains. You get some kind of antacid, it's going to neutralize or it's going to reduce the effect of the stomach acid. So you follow me, right? Stress is going to lead to negative outcomes because social support kind of prevent that or, or, or decrease the impact. And now with that little box on the screen, that says map, non-map. Is the social support in an Oxford house different between residents taking MAT and residents not taking MAT? And that's what we put to the test. And here are the results. Bam. That's why I told you to drink your Red Bull. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a mouse to, to show you, but the point is if you take a look at the point zero 0.02 in red to the left of the screen, and then the point zero 0.04 that's in green, basically it points to reductions of the effects of stress because social support. And those two coefficients for you math nerds, they're unstandardized betas, I mean unstandardized coefficients, so uh, you can't really say uh, the sizes are comparable. But the point here is that social support is effective. It reduces the effects of stress equally among residents taking MAT and not taking MAT when looking at quality of life and absence of self-efficacy. So that's like the other news. I mean, this is probably the most intensive stuff in my presentation, but it sets the stage for the other two studies. But let me kind of conclude the study by saying that Oxford houses provide valuable support in addition to, I mean, we know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but I need to be telling this to my professional community, people who read those, those scholarly journals, and I have to demonstrate every step of the way. And because of your involvement in our research, we're able to demonstrate it. So the effects of the social support are equal. People on medication-assisted treatments, now they're finally connecting. And I've always sensed that not everyone seeking recovery needs a recovery home, but there's definitely a population of people you cannot get clean and sober any other way. And this mechanism is going to be what connects people on MAT to live happy, joyous, and free. 
uh, and as I demonstrated, increases in the outcomes, decreases in the effects of stress. So that sets the stage for the two studies I'm going to talk about now. The good news is I could probably wrap this up in about five minutes. Uh, as Tad mentioned, Homophily, you know, I was on that sucker's uh, master's thesis committee. He was foolish enough to ask me to be on his committee. <laughs> no, actually, I kid, uh, Ted and I are really good friends. But that gave me an idea because of his research and his thesis. I'm like, wow, homophily effects. That last study I was looking at, I wonder if there's some kind of homophily effect. Sure enough, there was. So we're talking about the birds of the feather. We're talking, in this case, am I living in an Oxford house with at least one other person taking map? Yeah, I think you can kind of relate to this. You live in an Oxford house and there's like six drug addicts and you're the only alcoholic in there. And then somebody comes in for the meeting whose only drug of choice is alcohol. Like, yes, 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 let him in. <laughs> Homophily, I think you have that. You have that, like when your drug of choice is heroin or maybe you have mental illness and somebody's coming in with PTSD, you want that person who's got that kind of uh, similar experience. Uh, so, yeah, I think outsiders look at us like we're all in recovery, but there are some fine nuances. But, hey, diversity is our strength. So what I'm going to show you is the same analytic model I showed you on the previous slides, you know, looking at the same variables. But the difference is we're going to look at that model only among those taking MAT. And the difference is, are you taking MAT living in a home with at least one other person, or are you the island? Are you the only one in your home taking MAT? So that would be the moderator, and the visual will look like this. Uh, it's kind of hard to see from that distance. It's the same kind of model, only the moderator is we're looking at the effects of social support among those taking MATs living with others or not living with others in their Oxford house who are also taking MAT. Um, I like to be transparent. Here are the numbers. And I know PhDs, this will get their head spinning. It's very complex. But the simple point is, if you take a look again toward the left-hand side, the red coefficients, the zero, uh, sorry, minus 0 0.09 with three asterisks, that's a sign that that's a significant finding, a statistically significant finding. The green is minus 0 0.02, and there are no asterisks. Well, the green coefficient speaks to folks who are not living with at least one other person in their home on MATs, where the red coefficient that is significant says yes. I have at least one other person in my home uh, taking MAT. And the outcomes are the same, not just for quality of life, but also absence self-efficacy. And there's a test to show that these differences are at the level of significance. In other words, what's making it for people on MATs is having somebody else in their life who's also taking MATs, having at least one other resident. All right, that was painless. That was the third study. The fourth one, and then, you know, hopefully uh, you'll wake up or something like that. I mean, oh, uh, I don't know how I ever made it in school. I, anyway. Um, so the fourth study is not only looking at homophily effects, but looking at it with respect to a different set of variables. We know that when people have psychiatric severity, something that Ted mentioned, it's a measure of the extent that one is troubled or bothered by their psychiatric symptoms regardless of their mental disorder or the category. Uh, we use the Addiction Severity Index, uh, which is widely used in the addiction research world, is highly regarded, and the most reliable subscale is the Psychiatric Severity Index. It gives you a score from like 0, 0.00 to 1.00 is to what extent are you bothered. And I think it's brilliant because it's, it's a, a very efficient way to gauge one's psychiatric severity, regardless of what that category is. And there's research that demonstrates when you get to a certain way of measuring it is very, very accurate. So we're looking at psychiatric severity. You have a high degree of it. You're going to have bad outcomes in recovery. We're also looking at stress. You have high stress, bad outcomes in your recovery. And of course, the outcomes I'm going to talk about, absence, self-efficacy, and quality of life. So we know that stress and psychiatric severity are bad things. They pose a threat to one's recovery, regardless of your pathway. But we don't know anything about people who are taking MATs. Um, this is a very exciting time in addiction research. Um, I think we're the only ones who've looked at people taking MATs living in recovery homes. And Dr. Jason is hopeful that maybe he'll get funding this year. Uh, he's been uh, having a hard time getting funding from uh, National Institutes of Health. 
Uh, that's why it's very important that you all take these surveys. I mean, Dr. Jason did this for about nine years before he got funding. And we might be going through a dry spell. So whenever we come here, I mean, we don't get paid. You know, we do this because this is an extension of our service. Anyway, this to me is very exciting because uh, we don't know uh, the effects of stress on to psychiatric severity among people taking MATs. And it begs the question, can Oxford House, uh, Oxford House help? Well, we put it to the test in this model. Here you have stress up. It's not to the left. Here we say stress is going to have some influence on the relationship between psychiatric severity on the uh, left hand of the screen and our outcomes. We're not saying, is it going to smooth it out? We're saying, is it going to make it worse? So imagine you got that stomach acid and you're farting and you got stomach cramps. Well, stress is more like eating greasy French fries. I don't know about you, but when I got an upset stomach, the last thing I want to put in my stomach is some greasy ass food because it's just going to make it worse. And that's the deal. That's what we're talking about. Stress will complicate, exacerbate, worsen the effects of psychiatric severity. So here, the moderator is going to be folks who do not take MAT versus folks who do take MAT and live with at least one other person in their house versus a third group, folks who are taking MATs, but they are the only ones in their houses. And here are the results. Um, kind of hard to see, and I wish I had a, a, a cursor. But if you look at the three coefficients, I'm just going to step over here real quick. They're right here. This is blue, red, and green. Keep your eyes on that section of the slide. In the blue, it speaks to the effects of stress on this relationship for, for non-MAT folks. And it is not significant, meaning if you're not on MATs and you live in an Oxford house and you have a high degree of psychiatric severity, stress isn't going to make things worse for you. I mean, you still have the psychiatric severity, so you're, you're not in the clear. <laughs> but for the two other groups, folks on MAT, those living with at least one other resident versus those who don't have another fellow in there, it is a significant impact. Stress will worsen their psychiatric severity. It will greatly threaten and challenge their outcomes. But what is unique is if you take a look at the red and the green coefficients on the board, you see minus 8.93, and then in green, minus 15.99. Those values are different. And it's the same when you look at quality of life as an outcome. So because they're different, the impact of stress will affect people on MATs living in an Oxford house who have a high degree of psychiatric severity. But the impact is going to be lessened when you have at least two people taking MATs in an Oxford house. So that's the takeaway today that you know, some of the things that we talked about with homophily, social support, this thing I just showed you now, that if you have someone in your house on the MAT, really try to endeavor. The, the findings tell me the house and all the members will benefit if you bring in at least one other person on the MAT. Now, before I kick it out, I just want to give you uh, a little heads up for maybe next year. You know, what we're doing now is looking at uh, various sources of social support. Uh, we'll be presenting findings on that uh, next time we're here. Uh, and different kinds of social support in relation to psychiatric comorbidity. Ted mentioned recovery resources. I didn't like that when I heard Lenny was doing that. I'm like, well, what about 12-step involvement? That's a resource for the I mean, we're talking about a 12-step community. So I put together some analyses. And uh, it's a little teaser for you to come back next year, whether we're in Seattle or wherever. Hey, be careful. Seattle is an expensive town. I just found out this summer. My wife and I went there to see her girlfriend. Oh, Lord, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. But it's nice. People are friendly. Really good food. Yeah. And good, good luck going to the first Starbucks. It'll take you an hour to get in there. <laughs> and then Ted will, will show his findings from his dissertation. It looks very promising. And, and I'm sure there's some other things that we'll be showing because there's a lot of stuff that, that Lenny and his colleagues at the Center for Community Research are doing. Anyway, that's it for, for me. We want to say as a panel, thank you very much. And maybe you could scan this on your phone. Uh, please take the survey and, and encourage others. And at this time, what we're going to ask you to do 
is to line up at one of the microphones because this is being recorded. We would love to hear your questions, your comments, and your observations. Thank you. Hi, I have a question. Yeah. I'm so I'm Jason. I'm the state service rep for Area 5 in Spokane. Um, a couple years ago, I heard a kind of like a deal that if you if you do inpatient, your chances of sex or chances of success are 50-50. If you move into uh, Oxford after your your uh, inpatient, your IOP, and you move into Oxford for a period of about 18 months, I think it was, that your chances of success are jump up to about 75, 80%. Do you guys have those numbers? Those are the numbers that I've been told. If you wanna yeah. jump in on that one. Uh, great question, thank you. I know uh, Paul Malloy and Oxford House Inc. is, is Kapala Stats, uh, but I know uh, a couple of studies that come to mind. Uh, one of the first studies that was reported once DePaul got funded back in 2000, demonstrated much better outcomes at two years, being randomly assigned to an Oxford house versus being randomly assigned to treatment as usual when people were being discharged from rehab. Uh, at the end of the two years, we're talking about uh, significantly higher rates of employment, significantly higher rates of abstinence, and a lot less involvement in criminal activity. In 2013, I was the lead author of a study looking at outcomes over time. 12-step involvement independent from Oxford house. Oxford house versus usual care. And we found at the end of two years, if you were involved, categorically involved in your 12-step groups, you were like 2.8 times more likely to be continuously clean and sober at two years. But if you were living in an Oxford house, as opposed to going to usual care, your chances of being continuously clean and sober was 5.7 times that amount, independent from the influence of the 12-step groups. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, is this one is, working? My name is Patty Funks. I'm from um, Linwood, Chapter 1 in Washington. Um, I am one of those alcoholics living with, you know, with Matt, just so opiate users. Um, I, have in, I have encountered and seen a lot of um, prejudice amongst Matt and non-Matt users that were Suboxone users, again, as opposed to methadone and a real prejudice towards methadone and not wanting to vote people into our house. And I've also seen other ways. I just wonder if anybody had any comments about that. I just, because they, they, it's a significant um, reaction. So that's what. Thank you for your question. Basically, you, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know if, um, if you have done anything study-wise, methadone as opposed to Suboxone. Because I see a significant. Yes, uh, when we started this kind of research, we definitely noticed that that bias against people taking methadone versus uh, suboxone. Uh, maybe because methadone has been around for a few decades and suboxone is relatively new. You know, if it's something newer, it's got to be better. Um, I don't know, but clearly, clearly, there seems to be a greater acceptance on people on suboxone than on methadone. Uh, why that is, I can't say. But uh, to your point, I think that. You think about uh, the traditions of AA and NA. You know, you think about the first tradition, our common welfare should come first. And it seems like we're always kind of fighting with our opinions and our, our philosophical ideologies and all that stuff. But we got to put that crap behind and embrace someone. I was told never look down on someone unless you're willing to help them up. And unfortunately, we have our biases that we got to work out. But uh, thank you for thank your you. comment. That's a, that's a good approach. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, hi, I just um, had some questions about um, the data in your fourth study um, where you show that um, quality of recovery, uh, you know, was not really significantly affected by stress in those with severe psychiatric disorder. And that just kind of is um, anti-intuitive, counterintuitive to me. Um, so I would just like to hear maybe a little bit more about that. Sure. Um the first slide show that negative pathway from psychiatric severity to absence self-efficacy, but not quality of life. And 
the thing is, when you have so many variables, it's going to affect all the outcomes. Uh, it's, even though this pathway isn't there, through the mediational model, when you throw in the stress, then it is there. So stress does have a mediational effect. Uh, generally speaking, we should have picked it up. But that direct pathway, we didn't pick it up. So it's very good. Uh, well, you want to take one of my classes when I'm teaching research methods this fall? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Hello, I'm Chris. I'm an alumni in San Antonio, Chapter 19. And I've stayed in Oxford House two years. And I've been out a year now. And when we were getting... I, I got the privilege of being in several houses when they first started de uh, accepting MAP people. And the stigma or the prejudice was a real challenge. So what we did was we always had the best success with the ones who were willing to be more open about their, their uh, MAT treatment program. And often we'd get the most skeptical member of the house to go with them on a visit and see what it's all about, where well, they could talk to the, their provider and ask them the questions they wanted answers to. And the ones that are willing to be open and the house is work a way to get the members of the house involved in it, were very successful. And occasionally we'd have one that was more like, they didn't want to talk about it. And that, that tended to be less successful. Uh, could you expand on that for us? Certainly. Um, I definitely believe that if you go to a house uh, an interview and they reject you, you go to another one. And they might tell you, we think you're a better fit over there for maybe a number of reasons, whether it has to do with, with MAT or has to do with mental illness or LGBT or other issues of human diversity. Uh, that's one thing I think is great about the Oxford House, uh, about Oxford Houses. But uh, Casey Longham uh, has been making these... Uh, I guess I wouldn't say interventions, I would say these educational workshops throughout the country, educating people. Um, I think to Christoph's point that if we could kind of show people what's going on, kind of give them a, a glimpse of something that they don't really know, they might be a little bit more open. Because I was very closed against this personally, but then I realized, hmm, when you talk to people and you see them in their groups and all that, what does it really come down to helping people to where they are? So I... I know that if it's not MAT, it might be something else. And I've seen it for decades in Narcotics Anonymous. You know, somebody was sharing their experience, strength and hope, struggling with mental illness. And some Yahoo chimes in after and says, this is Narcotics Anonymous, not Psychotics Anonymous. So, you know, there's a lot of ignorance. But uh, I don't have any answers. But I know one thing together we can do that one of us can't do by ourselves. And it really warms my heart seeing the sense of openness in Oxford House. I would say keep talking about it. Um, you know, if, if Casey could come to, 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 your, to your region or your area, I, think, I know the Oxford House Inc. has been doing that and trying to get the word out to inform people. So, uh, we had, uh, I, I know Casey. Yeah, yeah, she's great. My name is Steve. I'm from Chapter 14, Topeka, Kansas. I am one of those people that uh, that was a little reluctant on on allowing Matt into the into the house. Um, I know that it's growing in Kansas, but it, I've been in Oxford for five years, uh, and I've witnessed a lot of overdose deaths, and it's it is continuously that is what's bringing my nervousness about it down. Uh, I've come to find out that anything that can help anybody beat addiction needs to be addressed. Uh, but we've also, it also has to be monitored in the house. It just can't be a free-for-all thing, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on board with, with Matt now. Uh, but one of the questions I wanted to seriously ask you, I know DePaul's, I've used DePaul for numbers on things. Uh, I have problems we are trying, we're in the midst of, op I've opened up three new houses in Topeka myself, and it's, it's, a, it's a stigma battling with realtors or landlords of, of, and I need numbers that can help that, not just on the addiction, you know, on the realtor side, on the, the land, uh, whether the, the value of the land goes up and down, and I know DePaul's got some of that stuff too, I don't know if they're still 
going with that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, there are some studies where we looked at uh, property values in close proximity to an Oxford house and further away and um, neighbors' perceptions. Uh, some of this might be on the Oxford House Inc.'s website with publications. Uh, look at one in particular that has, I think, uh, Dan Schober, uh, Leonard Jason, and what's that guy's name? National Lewis. I'm having a brain fart. Brad, Brad yeah, Brad Olson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Schober is, is the one who really did this, Dan Schober. I think it came out in 2006 or 2008. And when I get hired by attorneys, because, you know, the, the recovery homes that are opening up, it's not Oxford House, but they go to Oxford House Research and they get my name and they're like, would you, would you testify? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And I got data to show that it's not going to make things worse. You know, in fact, you know, property values go up and not down. And it's very human that there's going to be some apprehension. But over time, you know, anybody in a group living setting will win over uh, their neighbors, not just people in recovery. So I found that to be helpful in, in my matters as, a, as an expert witness, but also I've had some recruiters say, thank you for these studies. So you can probably talk to maybe some other recruiters about getting this literature or what's the best way to kind of win them over. But still, that stigma is not going to go anywhere. Just keep up the good work. Yes. Hi. Yeah, Michael McKinley, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so I'm a... I'm a I've been in recovery for numerous years, but the thing is, is I'm also an information technology uh, specialist at the St. Louis Public Library. And so I'm interested in the actual literature that can be put on our shelves for the libraries that can assist you and other researchers, as well as just the patrons looking for more information on MAT. Okay, uh, well, if you're talking about periodicals, they cost, in terms of subscriptions, mm -hmm. uh, the alternative is open access, but then there are people making buckets of money overnight, cranking out crap research by making it free, because then they turn to suckers like me, like, hey man, you're not tenured, you need a few more publications, why don't you spend five grand, we'll publish your turd. <laughs> so, that's a very short way of putting it. So. In terms of resources, the, re the research is coming out now about the community-based interventions. There's been a whole bunch of research in clinical settings, but let's face it, when people leave the clinical settings, they're going to fall on their face, like they did coming out of criminal justice systems, just like coming out of the 28-day rehab kind of thing. We need to have the community intervention, and now we're generating the research looking at the community response. So I think the only thing you could put on your shelf it's a handful of articles that are coming out, and then usually you need a subscription to those those academic journals. Oh, well, we have plenty of money to spend for that. That's just the thing, is that I'm just needing to know. I, I, I'll talk to you later. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I'm not telling you what to do, but you know, we give Paul Malloy these research articles, and he can do what he wants, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. He might post them on the website so you can have access to them. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't condone that because, you know, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Michael. I'm from Oklahoma, Chapter 2. Um, I'm interested in um, starting to compile some data more on like a, and organize it a little bit more so that we can make some informed decisions um, at like the chapter level or even more granular down to like house level. And kind of like what, uh, what measures you would think would be the most indicative of telling us what like a healthy house or an effective house and our, like our sick houses. A lot of times I think we just rely on financial data to try and interpret that and make decisions based on that. But I don't, I've actually come from a house that was financially a-okay, but there was not a lot of recovery happening. And so maybe some, you know, points of data that would be helpful in kind of building an architecture that would allow us to kind of see that and be able to make some decisions or you know, as far as moving people around or just stuff that we can make the Oxford houses that we do have more effective. Well, I think that you will continue to collect data to inform you in decisions in the house, but in terms of maybe qualifying the, the quality of recovery and that kind of stuff, well, then you have to get us in there. And well, we can't really get in there. I can't think of any one measures. We might want to do qualitative interviews. Maybe we'll use this one measure it's recently created recovery resources, but it's it's a lot of work and it requires expertise. I, I wish I could say, yeah, give this measure. This is the way to gauge it. Okay. But I don't know any off the top of my head. But I absolutely believe that houses that are engaged in the chapters do well. 
and, and staying in close contact with them. Consider that if it's a relatively new house, maybe that personality is still forming. Um, you know, are the, the residents really active in their 12-step involvement? So there are some common sense things that I think you, you know, but in terms of measuring it, I can't think of anyone measuring, like, oh, this would do it for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And we have probably time for one more question. Uh, my name's Eric from Chapter 11 in Oregon, and uh, my brother has paranoid schizophrenia, and I'd be hard pressed to vote him into my house just because I have a butt load of time with him in the past. I've been acquit a billion times, but I don't have any problem voting someone else in. How do I get my house or even start getting word to the chapters like we need to give these people a chance i think everyone deserves a chance like i'd probably still vote yes for my brother even though in two days he'd get kicked out for use but i i still the dual diagnosis that stuff is they deserve a chance and your research there is pretty interesting well i, I really fucking hate the term dual diagnosis because it really <laughs> minimizes the complexity of any one mental disorder as to say oh but a substance use disorder isn't serious number one number two i think in your brother's case we're talking about a classification disorders regarded as psychotic disorders you know i just saw my sister yesterday she's got alzheimer's early onset it breaks my heart but she's in a really good setting so i feel good about it um, so if you just say categorically somebody with a dual diagnosis is this way, you're missing the point. You know, it depends on the severity of it, depends if, it's, if it involves a lot, uh, out of touch, being out of touch with reality or maybe bipolar one. And it doesn't really matter what the category is, but can you work with that person? I really hope, and I think that we're going in the right direction with a sense of tolerance. You know, um, mental illness is just one thing, but you're really doing a disservice if you're not giving somebody an interview and giving them a chance to show themselves and then engage in the group conscience. It was just, it, I've seen it in my house meetings. Some guys come in and interview and we live in a small town and they're like, yeah, this guy's not gonna make it in our house. And a couple of guys know that and, and he ends up, they end up not getting voted in and it's really, really sad. I will say to play devil's advocate, whether they have a, a, a co-occurring mental illness or not, if they're not the best fit, maybe they should, go, they should go to another house. But if the grounds of rejection is purely on, uh, on the distal factor of having a secondary disorder, then that's when you have to chime in. We know a lot of us are getting misdiagnosed. And, and a lot of these treatment centers are giving us this BS label just to keep us in there so we get detox. And so you're gonna have to be that way. I'll just end by this because we have to wrap it up. About 15 years ago, we're presenting at one of these conferences. Dr. Jason is given the lead. And somebody came up to him at the end and he said, you know what you guys need to do? You need to be measuring tolerance. Because you see that woman over there? She's HIV positive. And there was a time in my life, I would never be in the same room with a person like that. And today, she's my wife. There is something about Oxford House living that to me is like the cream of the crop of recovery that tolerance, we need to lead by example. And if I'm drained and I'm just at my wit's sand with these ignorant mother flowers, then I'll call Ted. I'll reach out for help. Anyway, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Alex. Let's go ahead and thank our panelists. And with that, we'll end the session. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>